Yes. Tuti, you can switch off the screen now. Hi, Chinmaya, can you hear me? Hi, I'm here. All well? All good, how are you? So, should we start? Yeah. So, yeah, you can, you can switch on your screen. I mean, the camera. Hello. Yeah, we are being streaming this on YouTube as well. So, okay. let me just quickly... Give me a minute. Sure. Yeah. So a very good, good morning to all of you. My name is Amir and I'm uh, working with the NMS Resource Partner Wildlife Minister of India in Wildlife Minister of India, Dehradun. So today we are celebrating a part of National Wildlife Week, which is being celebrated uh, from 2nd to 8th of October every year in India. So we have been doing uh, different kind of activities since the past few days. And now we are switching towards the webinars. So this week aims at protecting, uh, the main aim behind celebrating the Wildlife Week was that it, it aims at protecting and preserving India's flora and fauna. And it was conceptualized in 1952, this Wildlife Week. Uh, with a long-term goal to safeguard the lives of the endangered and threatened species of animals of threatened species of India. So this week comprises of uh, in different parts. This is being celebrated throughout throughout India, which comprises of workshops, so that or or quizzes or webinars like we are doing today, to make people of every age, <clears throat> uh, so that uh, we involve the people of every age, so that they they get to know about more about the wildlife and the and the issues which are which we are facing in India. So today we have with us Chinmaya Ganegar. She is a PhD student in marine biology at the Wildlife Institute of India, where she is working on the project Campa Recovery of Dugongs and their Habitats in India. Her current focus of work is dugongs, seagrasses, and their associated and the associated fish. So being a native of coastal Maharashtra, her parents always encouraged her to observe and admire observe and admire wildlife. She pursued a master's degree in biodiversity uh, to further her interest. She has now worked on a variety of habitats, including evergreen forests, plateaus, coasts, and seagrass beds. Her PhD research involved direct underwater observations of fishes in seagrass areas of Park Bay and the Gulf of Manar in Tamil Nadu. Uh, for her PhD, she has been awarded the prestigious DST inspired fellowship uh, under the Dugong Recovery Program. She, is, she has been, uh, she's been working with the Tamil Nadu Forest Department for the recently notified Dugong Conservation Reserve in the north in the north park bay so chinmaya we welcome you here and the platform is for you to you can start your presentation thank you thank you Amir, for that beautiful introduction it summarizes kind of everything yeah so you, you can go ahead with the presentation you can share the screen and then we'll start and uh, one thing one thing i would like to i would like to add that if you have any queries or questions, so we'll because we are streaming it live on YouTube. You can post your comments on the in the uh, in the chat box, so we can take them uh, at the end of the session. Thank you very much. Over to you then. Uh, Amir, can you please enable me to share the screen? Yeah, give me a minute. Yeah, there you go. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, we can see. Yeah. yeah we can see is this. it full screen? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It is. Yeah. Okay. Hello, hello. Good morning, all. I I am Chinmaya, as Amir has introduced, and I'll be talking today about a beautiful animal in the Indian waters, which is confused with the mythological creature of mermaids, but it is as beautiful as mermaid. I'm pretty sure about it. So we will be talking about the umbrella it is holding for the habitat and other uh, species living with it, associated with it, and how it is contributing to the conservation of the seagrass habitat, which are very, very important for Indian waters and the fisheries of India. So uh, we are working in Camp Adirgong Conservation Project uh, in Wildlife Institute of India, which works along with a lot of 
people, lot of stakeholders, including forest department, uh, local NGOs like Omkar Foundation, Indian Navy, Indian Coast Guard, Marine Police. A lot of people are involved in this project. So I'll, I am happy that I am representing them and extremely thankful to Envis for giving me this opportunity. So the mermaids, which have been uh, the beautiful mythological creatures with humans and uh, fishes or fish tail like structure but they are actually thought of uh, like they were confused by the fishermen so they couldn't see the whole body of the animal so that's what i think that they have been confused with so if you look at these tails of these animals these are as beautiful as those mermaids in 1741 george steller has discovered this giant sea cow it is called a stellar sea cow, which is sadly now extinct after some 30 years of its discovery. Uh, so it is really extinct in 1800s itself, but it was huge. Like you can actually compare the differences between the uh, existing manatees and dugongs and this extinct species. Uh, so this mermaid was there uh, and was fished out which is which is very a uh, very sad part of it but right now the mermaids that we have in indian and world waters are manatees and dugongs and the whole world is kind of trying to protect them right now so today we will talk about the mermaids in india who are dugongs they belong to the order sirenia and the classification is uh, right there for you if you want to search it you can have a screenshot and search for it so these animals are uh, quite similar to elephants, which is very surprising. So if you read about elephants, they are uh, very uh, long living species. They live in herds. They have one calf at a time. Uh, the gestation period, like the period of a calf in a mother's womb is around two years. So it is very similar uh, of both the species, like dugongs live around 70 uh, years in age. They also have one calf at a time. There are few uh, instances of having a twin, but they are very far and in between. Uh, the calving interval, so the interval between two uh, babies is two to seven years, which is quite slow. And that is why it is very uh, important to conserve this species because they don't grow very quickly as uh, we might expect. The calf, as we can see in the photo, stays with mother for up to two to seven years, from which uh, it is dependent on mother's milk completely uh, for two to three years of the life. So they kind of uh, they kind of develop a very very strong bond uh, between mother and calf, and they are considered very. Uh, protective for their calves. So there are few fishermen stories like if the calf is around, you will obviously be able to see the mother. If the calf dies, the mother actually searches for the calf. These are the local knowledge which we have from the fishermen. And it is very important to understand the species. As of world level, these dugongs are uh, considered vulnerable as we have uh, different dugong populations in Australia, in Red Sea with us. So. Uh, as world level, if we see the dugongs are a lot, so they are considered vulnerable, not endangered, but that doesn't make them safe from anything. In India, we have very little population, which is also we uh, don't have exact, exact numbers as of now, but we consider that population to be less than uh, 400 to 500 individuals, which is very, very less for uh, the expanse of India's water. Uh, in Park Bay and Gulf of Mannar, we have approximately around 300 individuals, but we are still working on the numbers. Uh, so these 300 individuals are spread across around 500 kilometers of the coastline, and they are living in very, very shallow waters of India. And they are sheltered. They primarily uh, are coastline animals. So they interact a lot with fishermen. So the fishing boat goes uh, go out every day and fishermen see, there are places where fishermen see dugongs very frequently. So the interaction is quite common. That also makes them uh, very susceptible to the threats. And that's why they are put in the schedule one, which is as important and as uh, protection given like tigers. So as tigers uh, are important in schedule one, dugongs are important for us. 
so uh dugongs are specifically the only vegetarian mammal species living right now completely vegetarian they feed on these beautiful sea grasses you can see down there are around 15 species of sea grasses in indian waters and most of them dugongs feed on so we are working on that as well where we are looking at what species of sea grasses they feed on but they generally prefer smaller smaller sea grasses like halophila which are very easy to digest because of low fiber uh so they prefer that but in that case when you are having so easy to eat uh food you need to eat a lot so they uh eat around 40 kg of sea grasses every day one adult dugong eats 40 kg of sea grass which is a huge huge quantity if you try to imagine what a 40 kg looks like so it is very important to have uh these sea grasses uh for the dugongs and why i am saying this is the dugong is holding an umbrella for sea grasses is because uh, the dugongs are also uh, trying to aid help the sea grasses have a healthy habitat so what they do is like gardeners they trim those while uh, so if you can see this feeding trail uh, they feed and they make the sea grass growth control so they don't let the sea grass uh, create and have up so if you imagine a garden which is not maintained uh, we have all kinds of weeds and uh, so not wanted factors in the garden which is controlled by the gardener so it, he comes and trims the garden and it makes the garden really healthy it is the same uh, for dugong so what they do is they keep feeding on those uh, sea grasses and makes a lot of space for other animals makes uh, the makes growth in control of the sea grasses also uh, this is helpful in the uh, cycle of nutrition because it is uh, upwelling the sediment and it is also excreting and that excreta is very rich in nitrogen so it is kind of important for the nutrient nutrient cycle in the sea grass habitats uh, so this these feeding trails and this continuous grazing is very very important uh, to make that habitat very healthy and that's how it is holding an umbrella for other species and the sea grasses themselves as well so these this is the uh, photo of a grazed sea grass meadow from gujarat uh this photo is also showing you there is a lot of space for other animals who don't want to be hidden uh into the sea grasses who uh, suppose like uh, phytoplanktons or other uh, um, photosynthetic animals which can just come out and make their space of their own so that space is provided by dugongs and the species who are dependent on sea grass like crabs shrimps uh small fishes many other things those can live in this sea grasses happily because it is providing a lot of space and the space also provides a good amount of oxygen which makes other uh, species also very healthy so it is a photo from park bay which says uh, how many fish can live in a small sea grass bed you can see like till the background there are only fish so the beautiful meadows of park bay uh, are uh, there because of this dugongs and the healthy uh, health they are providing to the sea grasses so not only fish there are many many other organisms which are dependent on dugong are uh, dependent of dugong and sea grasses like sea cucumber flat worms uh, jellyfishes sea urchins so these all animals are living happily with the sea grasses and the dugongs and that's why because in conservation perspective it is very difficult to uh, see at all the small small animals that is why having an umbrella like dugong so if you protect dugongs everything uh, the sea grasses all these animals and many more others which are not in this photo can be protected uh, directly and indirectly if we put the right policies uh, in the name of dugong so it's like uh, having a protect family head uh, in the sea grass habitats so that makes dugongs uh, a keystone species a umbrella species and a flagship species so keystone species is some species which is there in the habitat and 
influencing other organisms lives very significantly so that is what is happening because if dugongs are not not there the sea grasses won't be healthy and the nutrient will not be upcycled the water will be turbid the water will be maybe not clear so that might hamper uh, other organisms as well so it is very safe to say that it is a keystone species as we are already talking about it is holding an umbrella for all the other species living in seagrass habitat which also includes uh, seahorses and turtles which are very important and uh, endangered and schedule one species and it is a flagship species for conservation as now we are getting into dugong conservation reserve also there is gulf of mannar national park whose logo itself is a dugong so uh, it is hold it is holding that flag of conservation really in india for marine uh, seagrass habitats so dugongs in tamil nadu are uh, found in these two area park bay and gulf of mannar in which gulf of mannar is already protected as it is a national park and biodiverse uh, bio uh, biosphere reserve in most of the parts so the regulations are in place it is protected by law but park bay uh, it is not yet protected uh, completely by law so uh, it is kind of a open area people can go and uh, do a lot of activities tourism activities uh, fishing activities other kinds of exploitation maybe having uh, structures in the water so all of that is happening in park bay because there is no uh, legal protection to it and we are slowly moving towards it i'm very glad to say that uh so campa dugong team has been working in this area since last 6 uh, years and we are we are surveying this area very intensively uh for uh, dugong sightings and seagrass meadows we also have a network of fishermen who keep uh, telling us where they have sighted dugong where a dugong death is happened uh, so that kind of information which is Uh, a citizen science information because uh, the fishermen who are contributing to this uh, data are very important to us so this is a citizen science map where they have told us that where they have sighted dugongs and where we have come come up with this map where we see that gulf of mannar and park bay has a lot of dugongs and they are being sighted very frequently uh, but gulf of mannar as having already protection we have focusing right now up to park bay where uh, if you can see the upper northern part of park bay has a lot of density at one place of dugongs so uh, that area is now uh, selected for conservation and is been converting to dugong conservation reserve so telling more about park bay it is a sheltered sea so we have india from one side and sri lanka from one side so it makes it a bay a sheltered structure it is not very deep the most uh, depth goes to maximum 12 meters to 15 meters but that is also very offshore like uh, in between india and sri lanka where the international boundary is near the coastlines of both the countries it is very shallow around 5 to 7 meters maximum and a lot of seagrass uh, grows in this area it is actually very dominated by seagrass meadows specifically the north park bay uh, wherever you go whatever beach you go you will see the seagrass washed ashore and it is very dense in this area and most of the ecosystem is comprised of seagrass and that makes it very important for the fishes for the other animals and the fishermen who are depending on that as well so that is why it is a very prominent fishing area uh, so to tell about tell more about sea grasses how they are important to fisheries is they act as nursery grounds so as you leave your uh, leave your kids to the nursery for making them grow that is what the fish do a uh, fish from belonging to other habitat maybe coral or open uh, waters they come to sea grasses not all of them but uh, many of them uh come to see grasses spawn there put lay their eggs the uh the fingerlings or the small fishes are living in the sea grasses uh feeding there hiding there from predators growing up there in a protected environment and then going back out to their uh belonging habitats uh, that are coral or fish so these uh grounds are extremely important to conserve for fisheries so to tomorrow if sea grasses are not there we don't have that protective nursery and we won't be having fishes on our plate for sure so 
uh, it is very important for us to conserve these uh, dugongs and seagrasses. So dugongs in Tamil Nadu, this is what the Tamil Nadu water looks generally. Uh, this is Tondi coast and uh, this is a video shared by a fisherman who has sighted dugongs and uh, its car, dugong and its calf uh, very near to the uh, coastline, maybe half a kilometer from the coastline. And you can also see a fishing net, a line of fishing net uh, from which they are passing through. This video says a lot about dugongs in Tamil Nadu that how they are kind of dodging the threads they have and still thriving as a breeding ground because the calf is very well connected with the mother. So it becomes an important message from this video that we need to really understand the intersection of humans and this species. Uh, not only dugongs, we have also cited very important species in seagrasses. So if you can see, uh, it is an alligator pipefish, which is also a protected under Wildlife Protection Act, uh, scheduled, uh, scheduled species, Schedule 1. So the protection I was talking about, the sea grasses. So if you can see that this is a, a camouflage fish. So it is living in sea grasses for whole its life. And it is camouflaging with it so to avoid predators. Also, uh, it is a great strategy for hunting. And as you can see, it is hiding in the seagrasses. That, that is how the seagrasses are used by other organisms apart from dugongs. This is what it looks if uh, you are not able to see it clearly. As we have already talked about, this is a general scenario, a daily scenario in Park Bay of the fishing pressure. If you can see the photo on the left, it is a huge jetty called Mandapam. And a lot of trawlers operate in that area, in the seagrass meadows, outside the seagrass meadows, everywhere. And this is not even the full catch of a boat. This is what I could just capture in a photo. And there were hundreds and hundreds of baskets of fish like this. So, uh, and if you go to a beach uh, on the right side of the photo, this is a general daily photo of a beach, beach where you can see uh, if a beach is one kilometer, you can actually expand this and understand how much boats, how many boats are there in one beach. And there are uh, almost 400 kilometer of stretch. And you can actually imagine the fishing pressure Park Bay has. Uh, it also is very important part of Tamil Nadu fisheries and Tamil Nadu fisheries stand uh, third in the Indian fisheries. So a lot of catch which comes to the inland, it, it comes from Park Bay. We have a lot and lot of fishing uh, activities happening, including shrimp farming, crab farming, uh, fishing, canning factories. A lot of things are happening here in Park Bay. So the fishing pressure is huge. But uh, at the same time, it is very important to understand the role of fishermen who are depending on that and here they come as rescuers. So this is a video where a dugong got caught in a net and the fishermen very responsibly released it back into the sea because they knew about this animal. They already have very, uh, very much connect and respect for the animal. They understand how important it is to release this animal. And they have taken the initiative to release this animal and they are kind enough to call us for this rescue. So they are not only contributing to the fishing pressure, but they are actually contributing to the conservation, uh, rescue and release of this species. So they, it makes them very important stakeholder of this whole conservation program. So what we do as Kampa Dubong project is, this is another video from uh, another rescue happened in Ramnathpuram district. So we felicitate this fisherman. It is the felicitation, it is the recognition of a good thing that they are doing. Because these animals are very less left in the wild, it is very, each and every animal is very important. So if you are rescuing one animal, you are actually uh, contributing to very uh, huge expanse of seagrass meadows and 
behind the cushion so uh, that is why it is very important to make them feel proud about it make them feel good about it so that this good did can uh, help other fishermen to understand and uh, behave more responsibly for uh, regarding this uh, fish species so we have uh, we are giving them uh, 10000 rupees cash if they are uh, releasing the animal also it is covered by national media international media and they are getting these awards from collectors ministers all of that where they feel important and it is extremely important for us to make them feel that value so that uh, they will help us more and more uh, henceforth so coming back to dewam conservation reserve this reserve right now uh, is uh, expansion is expanded in 50 kilometers of area this is so from adiram patnam to amma patnam it is approximately 50 kilometers of stretch and it is uh, in in the water from coastline it is 10 kilometers from the coast so uh, around 500 square kilometer area it is uh, the it is getting protected right now and tamil nadu government is very proactive in uh, putting uh, regulations for this uh, conservation reserve we are recently having a lot of meetings with administrations and the uh, forest department and other stakeholders to make this project actually happen uh, very strongly so this conservation reserve has a lot of potential and that's what the wii team and omkar foundation team did together that uh, we are intensively studying this area for what is the biodiversity of area so uh, the map looks all these lines half of the lines are surveyed already half are half are remaining and we we are working on that uh, so we are looking at the fish in the area sea grasses in the area other uh, invertebrates in the area what are the nutrients present what are the pollutants present how many dugongs are there what are the threats present in the area and we will be able to come up with a good set of data which will help the policy to make it stronger so till now we have eight dugong sightings these eight dugong sightings were uh, from November 2021 to March 2021, and these uh, sightings include mother and calf pair, which is also very hopeful for the reserve area that they are breeding. And uh, so, this is not the first incidence that where we have sighted a mother and calf in this area, but uh, it gives us a lot of hope about the con uh, condition. of their living you can see a photo uh, on the left corner of a mother and calf i know it's not a clear photo but it's taken by drone so the distance was quite high uh, we if you can see uh, on the right side it's a, a feather star and these kind of organisms which help in the nutrient cycle which are very helpful as prey base which are very helpful for the plankton uh, everything uh, is present in the area and that's how we are trying to protect these species by uh, the dugongs umbrella we have four uh, genera of sea grasses out of seven in this area we uh, maybe if we sample it more like those ten more lines we might find more species uh, and on the map you can see this is the expanse of sea grass we found till now so the whole conservation reserve mostly is covered by sea grasses and the dugongs are quite using those sea grass meadows we have taken a lot of samples around 100 samples for nutrients and macrobenthos and 19 fish genera are recorded out of which 10 are commercially important so they are very regular in market and this data will be uh, uh, a contribution into the detailed project report of dugong conservation reserve so detailed project report is a uh, is a management plan technically which will give uh, a complete uh, future of uh, this dugong conservation reserve so because we are setting it up right now putting the best management actions in the first uh, uh, first level it is very important that is why uh, we need to have these management plan in the place so we are working on that and this kind of biodiversity data will help uh, that management plan to become stronger so uh 
these are the dugongs uh, we have cited in the conservation reserve area one is a drone photo and i want to actually talk about the other photo where you can see two dugongs and this photo is shared by a fisherman who has cited five dugongs together uh, which is a huge thing as dugong biology because uh, as other populations in the world are studied we know that uh, dugongs have this behavior called laking behavior so when whenever their mating period uh, is there uh, the the males and females come together at one place they uh, the males display their powers and the female chooses that male for uh, mating so this kind of behavior we were not sure because of the small numbers of dugongs in the uh, in india so we were not sure if it is happening anymore or not so this fish this photo uh, given by a fisherman where he saw five dugongs together might uh, make Uh, this statement that the leaking behavior is still happening and we have a lot more chance of having more pregnant mothers of uh, dugongs and a good population good breeding population in the conservation reserve area so uh, my take away from all of this work uh, is that all the conservation cannot happen without these three very important part one is research and awareness where they go hand in hand we are doing research at one hand the awareness where fishermen are getting aware and then getting back to us with more data is a baseline for understanding the importance of an area habitat or a species translating that information into a policy and actually making it happen which is a very strong sign of our administration and i'm extremely grateful to tamil nadu government for doing it and right now we will be going into the process of implementation so all of this would actually come together and make this conservation reserve happen and conservation of dugongs and all these other species happen very effectively as we all hope and as citizens it is need uh, it is our uh, duty to make uh, people understand that this is happening and how important it is for everybody uh, on uh, in india specifically so it is not the dugongs who are only the keystone species or key species in the habitat these are us also who will be doing research awareness policy making and implementation of those policies policies as these key uh, key species may be recovered i'm very extremely grateful for my team my uh, guides dr johnson and dr shiv kumar uh, forest department who is extremely proactive right now and doing some amazing work out here for the conservation reserve omkar foundation who is also a huge stakeholder and uh, contributing to research and policy making and all these people i'm very very grateful and i'm sure the dugongs will be happy because of all of these people and all you guys who understand about these about this conservation reserve uh if you want to know about us the team the conservation reserve more these are our social media handles of campa dugong project of wildlife institute of india we also celebrate world dugong day on 28th may where we have online quizzes competitions also physical uh, programs a lot of things happening in the month of may so you can join us by that time also so please check out our handles uh thank you thank you so much i am very grateful for this opportunity for uh, to the envis and all the people who have given me thank you wonderful presentation chinmaya so i will just head on to the youtube and let's see if we have any questions for you sure okay yeah just let me just quickly go to the youtube so we have one question from abhishek jamalabad so he is okay. saying that uh, is it possible that the citizen science based site selection is biased towards locations where people submit sightings sighting reports more readily i have also sent you the question via chat also you can just give it a read and then okay answer. thank you abhishek for that question it's a very valid question <clears throat> i completely understand the concern of uh, having a biased sampling but luckily we have uh, in this 500 km stretch, uh, stretch we have almost a network of 5000 people who are working tirelessly and are in contact with us we are also making sure that uh, 
this uh, contact establishment is continuous so we are uh, literally having uh, follow up calls mostly monthly daily we also do awareness programs so that that is our effort towards making this bias less and less considering the other part of it so park bay we are mostly po focused on park bay where uh, not only fishermen are uh, giving us information indian coast guard indian navy marine police forest department all these uh, all these institutions are contributing to this data so uh, very unfortunately uh, we don't have any sightings from south park bay as of now recently and this all data uh, i am pretty sure is very less biased i won't say it's uh, it is scientifically incorrect to say not biased but uh, it is very less biased and we are still working towards it also uh, it is a good uh, thing to have two protected areas in one stretch so to create a network of protected areas uh, one more aspect of this is that you cannot wholly protect the area without having anybody's interference because it is also important for our economy so having one area connected to the other will be a very great strategy that's what i personally think right now but uh, answering your question we are working uh, very uh, tirelessly towards not having that bias thank you Amir, any more questions? Can you hear me? Yeah. So we have we have another question from Satya Swaroop Nanda. Okay. Uh, he's, he's saying wonderful presentation, ma'am. Are there any plans of tagging dugongs to maybe make an inventory of our local population and understand them better? Thank you so much for that question. Uh, there are plans i'm not saying there are no plans but they are very difficult to execute because the dugong population is very uh, on verge right now for india and uh, tagging one animal so as dugongs are very shy animals in the first place they really uh, are not that uh, fierce to interact with the human population and as we have seen in a lot of rescue cases that they uh, tend to get stressed when they come in contact with other uh, bigger species like humans or uh, maybe boat or something like that so while tagging we need to be extremely careful uh, this is a fear that we all of us have that in the process of tagging what if we even lose one individual that will hamper the whole dugong population so there are other non invasive ways we are trying to understand the population better like drones and uh, citizen science so i hope we can come up with that uh, and i also hope that we may uh, come stronger with the research to, to uh, tag the dugongs and understand the population better we also have a, i want to add to that that we are also having a genetic study uh, you can check that out by uh, yellapu et al i may share that link in the youtube uh, comment later so uh, you can check that out where we are actually collecting uh, dugong samples uh, tissue samples and understanding dugong population where we have already understood that the uh, indian dugong population is very different and ancient than other populations in the world and it is also kind of interacting uh, with the island populations of uh, southeast asian islands so that kind of a technique we are also trying to use in our project to understand the population better thank you very much chinmay so we have an, we have feedback from abhishek abhishek said thank you chinmay uh, it was a very informative talk we look forward to more in the future about the reserve management tool thank you thank you so much abhishek so i think that's it from the questions we have we don't have any questions okay yeah so it's so yeah thank you chima thank you very much so dugongs thank you so much yeah so uh, you are, as you rightly said dugongs truly are our coastal chubby vegetarian mermaids <laughs> and, yes, and have important ecosystem services so uh, we understand that a healthy seagrass community is not only important for numerous organisms or organisms uh, from the tiny crustaceans to the massive dugongs but also for the sustenance and welfare of the meadow dependent fishing communities 
Yes. Uh, in the case of rapid scale of industrialization and un unsatiating greed, uh, higher conservation priorities uh, should be given to dubongs uh, and the seagrass meadows to help conserve the whole coastal ecosystem. So we would like to thank you and congratulate for your talk. And we look forward to see you uh, soon uh, with such with with more such informative talks. And we wish you all the best. And we would like to thank MOFCC and Wildlife Institute of India for providing us this platform so that so this was the basis so we could reach out to more people and we could spread their, uh, this information and make the people more aware about these uh, chubby moments. So yes. thank you very much for joining us all. And we'll be meeting tomorrow again. We'll meet tomorrow again uh, with we have an we have an uh, we have a, we have a speaker called who is uh, who is the, who is an ex MSc from the Wildlife Institute of India, Abdul Shakur. So he'll be talking about ants, little things running around the world. So we'll meet you tomorrow. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you.